I'm going to read to you from Judges 12 and verses 4 to 6 in the NIV Bible. All will come clear as I read this confusing passage to you, I promise. Though this is only the second time ever I've done this message, so it could still be a train wreck. <laughs> Hopefully, if it is, only I will know. Because I have an idea how it should drive, and you don't. Jephthah then called together the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. The Gileadites struck, down, struck them down because the Ephraimites had said, You Gileadites are renegades from Ephraim and Manasseh. The Gileadites captured the fords of Jordan leading to Ephraim. And whenever a survivor of Ephraim said, Let me cross over, the men of Gilead asked them, Are you an Ephraimite? If they replied, No, they said, All right, say Shibboleth. If he said Sibboleth instead of Shibboleth, because he could not pronounce the word correctly, they seized him and killed him at the fords of Jordan. Check this out. 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. 42,000 humans were put to death because they couldn't pronounce a word. So the title of this idea, this concept, is called the Shibboleths that divide us. The shibboleths that divide us. I know, I know I should get back to faith part three as my titles. <laughs> then putting stuff up like that, they're like, what in the world is this person talking about? Maybe you never heard the word shibboleth. You didn't know it was in the Bible, so you learned something tonight because it's the part of the Bible where the, perhaps you haven't visited for a decade. But it is a very interesting story, and it struck me as having relevance to us 21st century people, not just Christians, but people, because I think this is still continuing today in different forms. Let me give you a little bit of the plot and the subplot, what makes a movie better than an average movie, what makes a book better than an average book, is not the plot, it's the subplot. What makes your life fascinating isn't the plot we can see, but it's the subplot we can't see. What makes humanity painful is that often your brain is aware of the plot you can see, but your soul is involved in a plot you cannot see. And when God wrote the story of your life, by the way, he started with the subplot, not the plot. So you live your life in complete bewilderment about what the heck's going on, while God is working all things together for good, that's okay for God. But we're in the midst of it, not knowing what's going on. And this is a story where the subplot is interesting because Joshua, that was the last judge that passed away after he took over from Moses, Joshua, as you know, was commissioned by God, following on from Moses, to clear out all of the enemy nations in the promised land of Canaan. Joshua didn't do that. He had another idea, which was, we won't kill them all, which God told us to do. We'll let some remain, and we'll let thousands and millions of them possibly stay alive, and we'll just make them slave labor. So Joshua, and I think, thought he had a bright idea, an economic genius idea. We'll put them into forced labor, and we will live off their labor. We'll get them to sow our fields and take care of our you know, situations of building and inhabiting the land. But what it did was, following Joshua's generation, the land was filled with rogue nations that were against the Hebrew and the Israelites and their God. And it became a massive contamination and a massive confrontation issue for generations following. And that's why the book of Judges is a book of complete carnage. It is a time described by the writer himself and it's described as a time when there was no king and everyone did what they saw fit in their own eyes. It was a time of complete anarchy. This is Wild West people that we're reading here. It really is. Some of the stuff in the book of Judges, it will shock you to the core like this story does and there's worse stuff in here than that. And so this is the subplot. And so these remaining nations that were at war with Israel kept popping up in skirmishes and sometimes full-on wars to try and wipe out Israel and deny them of their inheritance that God gave them. 
in the land and the contamination that continued to be in their world by these rogue nations that Joshua didn't take care of. Jephthah was a Gileadite, the start of this story tonight. Jephthah was a Gileadite and he tells us he was a great warrior. His brothers, however, drove him away from the family in his youth because his mother was a prostitute. So his brothers saw him as, as the runt of the litter, as it were, and excluded him and, and persecuted him, and he had to flee from them for his life. He was disinherited from the family line, and Jephthah fled, it tells us in the other parts of this narrative, to the land of Tob, T-O-B, which means goodness. It says there that in the land of Tob, a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him. I guess if you're a leader, people will find you some way or another. So he flees from his homeland. He goes to this obscure place called Tob, T-O-B. Probably couldn't find it on a map like Bradford. <laughs> I spent my life explaining to people, no, Bradford isn't near London. Where do you live? England. Where? Bradford. Is that near London? Uh, no. No. So land of Tob was a bit like that, I suppose. And that's where he went and people found their way to him. Never think that people will not find you. If you have a gift on your life, I promise you, it will make room for you. There's never been an easier time than now for us to find you, for us to find your voice, for you to find the tribe that are interested in your voice or your product or your idea or your book or your blog or your podcast. There's never been a better time, an easier time to get your voice out and he didn't have that to his advantage so he just went and fled in exile to this place and people found him and gathered around him. Years later the Ammonites, one of these rogue nations still there, went to war with his home tribe with the Gileadites and the Gileadites that were been attacked by the Ammonites sent a message to Jephthah knowing he was a killing machine and a great warrior and said, would you come and protect us from the attack of the Ammonites? And he said, I will on certain circumstances, certain outcomes. And he made them promise him that if he came and swept in with his core, hardcore, you know, Navy SEAL Spartans and delivered them, that they should allow him from then on to become the leader in the Gileadite tribe. So they were so desperate and scared to death that they promised him the world and so Jephthah comes and responds to the elders, fights the Ammonites and kills them. Next bit of the subplot. The Ephraimites, in other words, another neighboring Israelite tribe, so the same team, the same nation as the Gileadites. They decide they want to have a massive complaint and take issue with Jephthah because he didn't consult them and invite them to go to war with him against the Ammonites. So they felt he's trying to take all the glory for himself is Jephthah. So we're going to teach him a lesson. And so they sent a message to him. You're in big trouble because you didn't invite us as your fellow Israelites to go to war with you. You kind of just want the glory for yourself. What we've heard about you is true. You're out of control. It's out of order. I guess it sounded something like that. Jephthah responded back to them, which is interesting in the narrative to explain what's going on here. He said to the delegate that came to give him that message, send the message back, by the way, to the Ephraimite leaders. I did ask you. I did ask you for help. We don't know that he did, but he tells us he did send word for help, but they didn't listen to the voicemail, <laughs> is what happened. And so Jephthah said, hang on a minute. I absolutely sent word for you to help me, but I got no reply. Nobody came because perhaps the Ephraimites were hoping that he would get killed and the, and the Ammonites would take care of their problem with Jephthah and these rogue warriors up in Tob that were being spoken about all over Israel. And perhaps they hoped that the Ammonites would kill him and so they didn't respond to the voicemail but a few of the leaders in Ephraim knew, full well they knew, that he did reach out for help. So something's going on here that's very sinister and dark and Jephthah was having none of it. So he attacks the Ammonites, he wins, then he has a problem with his own people, with the Ephraimites, so Jephthah finishes up at war with his own people, with the Ephraimites. 
Are you all with me so far, children? <laughs> so they go to war. And the battle as such ends. And Jephthah has this genius strategic idea because he was a leader. And that's what leaders do. He said, I'm going to set up a roadblock. Because there's only one road back to Ephraim territory. The Ephraimites have to go home. And they're going to have to cross the fords of Jordan. It's a one-way system. There's only one place. They have to cross the fords of Jordan to get back into their homeland. I'm going to set up there a checkpoint. And as people come by, morning, noon, or night, we're going to have a password. And we're going to make them say shibboleth because Jephthah knew that Ephraimites couldn't pronounce the shh sound in their vocabulary. So he set up this foolproof, perfect tell idea that would give away the fact that they were Ephraimites. So if they said, no, we're not Ephraimites, we're your friends, we're not part of that crowd, then the troops would say to them, okay, then say Shibboleth. And they said, Sibboleth. I couldn't say it. And on the basis of not being able to pronounce Shibboleth, they got killed on the spot. 42,000 lost their lives because they couldn't pronounce the word shibboleth. Wow. You know, maybe, maybe an apology from the Ephraimite leaders would have saved 42,000 lives. Maybe the Ephraimite leaders that did get the voicemail, but covered it up and still took their nation into war, and had massive carnage because of that decision. Maybe an apology to Jephthah for not responding to the voicemail, for not supporting him, would have averted this disaster. But they didn't. So instead, we have this scenario, and I think hell hath no fury. Like a rejected, despised, hated, excluded person who unhealed ends up in charge. Proverbs 30, 21's version of what I just said says that under three things the earth trembles. Under four it cannot bear up. A servant who becomes a king is one of those things that the earth trembles under. Or the message version says a janitor who becomes the boss. Because that's what's happened here. The underdog, the excluded Jephthah because his mother is a prostitute that was no fault of his. He was excluded like many of you in life through no fault of your own have been excluded, marginalized, not welcomed. You don't get to the party anymore. You've been deleted from the family and friends WhatsApp channel. You're not popular anymore. You don't get a Christmas card anymore. You're off the list through no fault of your own. Often people in life, in society, entire groups in society, that we do that to, if they ever finish up in a place of power over your life, you're in trouble. Because when the janitor finishes up in charge, it's payback time. For all the people that abused me, took advantage of me when I had no power. That's what's going on here. It's a complete shift of power away from the Ephraimites to Jephthah and to his warriors with him. It's massive payback time. And so he invents this shibboleth idea. Shibboleth, metaphorically, to me tonight, for us to understand this in a contemporary situation here, 21st century, shibboleth is any custom, any tradition, any belief or belief system, any principle that separates or divides one group of people from another to the point where we would go to war, where we would kill each other, where we would abuse each other, where we would persecute each other, any, anything that would create that between us as humans, individually or people groups, could rightly be called a modern day shibboleth. Something that you can't get past. Something that is, your, that is your area where you draw a line and say, if you, can't, if you can't play ball this way, if you can't believe with me that, if you're not on my side, if you're not one of us, you're one of them. And the world's never been more divided than it is now on shibboleths. Are you one of us or one of them? 
I live in England, but I have a home in America too. America has never been more divided than it is now. And America is, are you Democrat or Republican? Are you black or are you white? Are you rich or are you poor? Are you one of us or one of them? Are you for us or against us? Are you a believer or a non-believer? Are you a good or a bad person? Are you straight or are you gay? Are you a criminal or are you a good person? And, and so on and so We have these labels and we have dividing up of society, never more than we have now. And it's going on all around us. And all of these things that are where you say, this is me and that's you and never the twain shall meet, is an equivalent of a modern day shibboleth that is dividing the world and across the planet, this is why I'm speaking around the world about the need for us to allow nuance in our relationships. Because I believe tyranny, tyranny is the removal, the deliberate removal of nuance. When I deny you any shade different to the ones I say are valid, and nuance comes from the French word nuance, you say it like Beyonce, Nuance is French for shade from where we get the word nuance. And so if I don't allow you nuance, then I'm going to have a shibboleth. You're going to have a shibboleth. No deal, no negotiation, no deviation, no shades beyond what you think is the only way to do something. The only way to think about this, the only way to proceed is this way, my way or no way. When we have those in our humanity, then what we do is we force people to make choices they shouldn't have to make. And if we say to people, you can be one of us if you fit in with us by being able to say shibboleth, as it were, then you can be one of us. But if you can't do that, then you can't be one of us I and mean, you'll never be one of us. And again, another barrier goes up. That's why I say to people around the world when I speak about that, how many people like green, the color green? And of course, many people put their hand up. It's not a trick question, or maybe it is. How many people like green? And you might be thinking, yeah, I like green. And then my question to you to make the point is, which one? Because there's officially 500 shades of green. I didn't know that. 500. There's 12 green greens. What's the point? But when you add in our humans perceived color, there's over a million shades of green. Because each individual sees color dif differently. Re remember the internet dress? Is it white and gold or blue and black? And those of you that saw it one way could not believe that someone saw it the opposite to you. You were convinced somebody was crazy. It's that kind of obsession that we get over the dress is this color. And if you don't see it that way, something's weird about you. Something's off here. But every human has individual eye receptors and your eye receptors govern the way you perceive depth and height and shade and tone. And so we all see the same green but see it differently. But what's happening in the world is we're all going to war over green. Not knowing we both love green. We just love different shades. So if you tell me your green is the only green and I say my green's the only green, then that's what I mean. We create a shibboleth over a shade and say, this is it. And believe me, the church is full of shibboleths. The church has been so attached to our methodologies, to our ideas of how things should happen and how people should behave. And as I said earlier, the types of people that we should welcome and trust. It's easy to welcome them in our theology, in our preaching until they come and sit next to you. Or better still, sit where you normally sit. <laughs> you ain't seen an upset Christian till someone comes and sits where they sit. And I had that in my church. So the actual seat became a shibboleth. You sit in my seat, something's not right here. People said to me, Pastor, you've got to help me. What's the problem? Well, these people that you bring in on these buses, these people, they're sitting where we normally sit. I'm like, I'm not seeing a problem here. You, you, you are the people that are the most animated in the worship. You're the ones that are falling under the power of God. Now you're having drama. Somebody sat where you're sat. What's going on here? And I realized that was the thin end of the shibboleth wedge. It got worse from then on. As all this stuff began to emerge that I didn't know was in our hearts as a church, that were against people getting into our church because they couldn't say the password. They didn't know the secret words 
that we had in our church, the secret behaviors. The, they didn't know how to fit in. And when people can't fit in, we're threatened by them. And we put, we put these, these shades on them. And we say, well, if you can't get beyond that and be part of this shade, then never the twain shall meet. And we have our own versions of the early church sent out these people called Judaizers. And the Judaizers went to Gentile territory and said, you can't be a proper Christian. You can't be accepted by God unless you do circumcision or keep certain rituals or, or, or you are, you're going to commit and sign up to certain Jewish customs. And until you do that, you can't really be a born again person. And the apostle Paul was outraged about that behavior. And it finished up in Acts 15 in a massive sit down called the Council of Jerusalem where this all had to be sorted out because the, because the Jews, the extreme Jews, were creating shibboleths. Was saying, you've got to be able to clear, jump over this fence, jump through these hoops. You've got to be able to say shibboleth by doing the things that we think are what God wants you to do. You can't be acceptable to God till you look like this, sound like this, behave like this. And I think we in the church have to have a radar for our shibboleths. That's why I say, by the way, if you were here all this morning, perhaps again tonight, that's why I'll say things like, raise a hand if you want to give your life to Christ, but if you don't want to raise a hand, that's cool too. Because I don't want the raising of hand to become a shibboleth. That our methodologies become something we're so married to, that if you do something different to that, we say, well, no, 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 you, you can't be born again if you didn't do it that way. And we have many obvious and many non-obvious below the radar versions of that. And I don't want us to default to it because it's happening all around the world. And I just think it's worth raising our awareness that your week may look a lot different this week if you could go into it with a shibboleth spotting radar in the way that you relate to people, in the way that you are doing life. Maybe you are creating your own shibboleths and people just can't get beyond it and you're not willing to compromise and give ground and so we separate over something that's just not worth it. I was in um, Kenya some years ago in the north of Kenya with the Kikuyu people. When the Kikuyu people in Kenya speak English, they can't pronounce the letter L. <laughs> it's hilarious. And I didn't realize how hilarious it would be till I kept hearing them talk in the meeting and shouting glory to God. <laughs> or oh, Harry Ruya. <laughs> but it got really hilarious and out of control when they decided to give us a traditional clap offering. <laughs> so the pastor's wife got up and said to the church, we want you to give our English visitors a crap offering. <laughs> oh, I thought I've had a few of those in my time. <laughs> a crap offering. And me and my mates that went were just dying laughing. They're not aware of what that meant in England. And so they started, they started clapping or crapping. <laughs> then she got up and stopped them and said, no, no. Church, this is not good enough. This is not good enough. We need to give them a mighty crap offering. <laughs> so we had a mighty crap offering. I hope you'll have a better one in a few weeks. That's what I mean. So if this was a story about Kenyan tribes, you'd have been easy to find out who Kikuyu people were, get them to say clapping. Or hallelujah. In fact, in the Pacific Wars, um, when the Americans were fighting the Japanese, I did this research and realized that for the American sentries that were guarding certain cross points and strategic points when they were at war with the Japanese in the Pacific, they would have these sentries that would shout out because of the cover of night. They didn't know who it was. They'd make people say the word Lollapalooza. I know. And the Japanese would not be able to pronounce the L's and say, Rora Parusa. 
and, and, and they were busted and we are busted on so many things that we think no one will spot and it becomes a separating issue. Lollapalooza, by the way, I found out, in case you wonder, that's a weird word, means an impressive, attractive person like myself. <laughs> so even in recent history, these versions of shibboleth literally have taken place in people's lives. You know, shibboleths can be in-house jargon that an outsider doesn't feel part of. Like I said earlier, I could come here as a visitor, but feel so alienated, and you don't know how alienated a visitor can feel because you've been on the inside too long. I remember the first time I ever got saved, I went to a house group. I didn't even know what a house group was. It sounded dodgy to me. And I went to a house group, and the house group leader said, uh, welcome everybody tonight to our house group fellowship. I thought, what, are we in the Shire or what? <laughs> what? Then this guy said, um, let us turn, let us turn to the book, the epistle. He said, the epistle. Let us turn to the epistle, to the Ephesians. I'm like, what did he just say? What? And I'm looking around wondering, what do they, I'll just do what they all do. The epistle to the Ephesians. And because I was so raw and so genuine, and you lose that the longer you're in church, and you shouldn't. I said, excuse me, uh, uh, what's an epistle? He looked at me like, what? How come you don't know that? And I felt terrible the way he looked at me. You'd be surprised how much we can put people off by this shocked look when they ask a simple question that you used to ask. But now you use that all the time and it's like, oh, you know, well, an epistle is. We have our own little ego trip about we know what an epistle is when nobody cares. If you just said, let's turn to a book in the Bible. It's a letter. Some people call it an epistle, but I don't because it's an old word we don't need anymore. I'd have thought, this is a cool guy. But it was the epistle to the Ephesians like, you know, I know stuff. <laughs> when I first went to a church service and the pastor got up and said, let's all turn to John. I'm like, where's John? Who, who, who's John? Why are we turning to him? Where is he? Where is he? That's how ignorant I was. When the pastor spoke in tongues, because the pastor was West Indian, seriously, I thought it was like some, you know, Caribbean, West Indian, Jamaican language. You know, and... and, and and so he's, he's jabbering away in tongues and I, I thought, whoa, this is amazing. I don't know what he's talking about, but cool. I never heard Jamaican before. <laughs> Seriously, talk about shibboleths that could have wiped me out. Hundreds of them. I did not know, seriously, I did not know that this man's first name was not Pastor. <laughs> Seriously. For months, months. And one day I heard a lady say to him, George. <laughs> Called him George. And I'm like, no, 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 love, no, no, love, no. He's not George, he's pastor. <laughs> His name was George Miller. I said, no, past, it's, it's Pastor Miller. Because I thought pastor was the Caribbean name, you know, Rasta, pastor. <laughs> I don't know. Why not? <laughs> I thought he's a Rasta pastor and he speaks in that language. I'm down with that. I was so ignorant. The first time I ever went to church, I went and sat on the front pew, wonder why no one was sat there. I'm like, this is crazy. I'll go sit there. Not knowing that that is not for anybody but the communion servers who somehow appear on cue during the service and I'm sat there not knowing what the heck's going on, just sat there on the front bench and suddenly partway through, these two guys come, suited and booted, these elderly gentlemen. They came and stood in front of me, facing the congregation, three of them, and went like this. I thought it was a free kick. <laughs> I did. I thought, wow, I've never seen that before. In a church, good grief. Where's the ball? Who is it a penalty or what? 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 Then Rasta Pastor said something. <laughs> These guys move into action, doing their thing. 
doing that communion thing. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. I was completely bewildered. No one explains zero to me. And on it went. When I, when I, when I got um, filled with the Spirit and eventually got baptized in the Spirit after a lot of, uh, after a lot of shibboleths going on, <laughs> this guy once said to me, you know what, to, get to, to, to speak in tongues, because in the Pentecostal church, speaking in tongues people was superior to those that didn't. It was like a pecking order, like a hierarchy. And I was like one of the plebs. I was one of the minions because I couldn't speak in tongues. So eventually I get baptized in the Spirit, I speak in tongues, and I just thought it was so cool to be able to just do this thing. And I was still at school. I got saved when I was 15. I was still at school. And I decided to reach out to my friends that I would do tongue speaking demonstrations. <laughs> I know. And I was amazed at the crowd. All my mates came and I would stand there and say like, you know, well, if, you know, a, a few months ago, I, you know, got saved, whatever language I could figure out, I got saved. They're like, what in the what? I said, and I got filled with the Spirit, like, what? And I said, I can speak in a language I never learned. Like, God, get out of it. Go, get, go on then. I said, right, I want you all to be quiet. I said, I'm just going to close my eyes and I'm going to just speak. And I closed my eyes. <laughs> and I just spoke in tongues. The room was like, I opened my eyes, looked at them like, one of them said, do it again. <laughs> like as if I'd made it up. Do it again. So I did it again. They were freaked out. They said, hey, okay, so we need, we need you to do this again. We're going to, let's do this tomorrow. We're going to bring our mates. So I did about three or four and realized, realized some of the people coming were flaky. So I started charging. I did. It's time this came out. This is cathartic for me tonight. I started charging. And I said, you know what? I'm going to charge you all, whatever it was back then, like 40 pence or something each. I thought, I'll get the price high enough to screen out the people that are not sincere. <laughs> and I had about 30 of them came, paying me 40 pence a head. I did well off that little gig <laughs> for about three, four days before the school teacher, school teacher that led me to Christ found out. <laughs> then he, as the Bible said, show me the way more perfectly. So I came into this church world, to talk about shibboleths as I, as I think back, as they come to me as I'm telling you. I don't think you should think, we should think that we don't have our equivalents of it still in the church world. That's why I think what happens up here, I used to say to one of my secret shoppers, your job is to secret shop what happens up here. Are we using language that you need to be Moses to understand? Is, is, is our tone, is our stuff on screen? Is the language that we use on screen, is the way that we communicate, is, is our body language, what is all of that saying? Are we, are we relevant? Are we contemporary? Do we connect? Or looking back now, I would say, is the shibboleths up here from the leaders and the pastors? Am I coming across in a way that is creating false options? that is creating false situations? Do I have my own shibboleths as a leader that I am inadvertently putting onto the church? Because we can all have blind spots. And I want you as you go into your week to ask yourself, do I have in my life, in my relationships, my marriage, my friendships, my work relationships, my life in the community, my life in the church, do I have my own, you know, no-go can't cross this line things that become your little shibboleth that protect you from those other people and because they can't sound and look and behave like you want them to you are denying them an inclusion in your heart are you doing that are you contributing to this divided world that we are living in and is there something in there that you can think hang on a minute I don't think this person hates green. I don't think I'm defending green. I think if I could put myself in their shoes, I think I would feel like they felt. I think if I could be in their shoes for a week, I think I would understand where they're coming from. I think these people are hurt. I think they've been through stuff. I think someone's handled them badly. 
And I think I don't need to be another one in line that's handling them badly. Especially if they've been handled badly by a series of Christians. It's your chance this week when you meet someone that wants to enter in to your world. It's your chance to not lay another shibboleth on them. To ask yourself, check yourself first. And to say, I don't want to contribute to this issue in the world. I want to have a kind of heart and a kind of faith that makes it easy for people to approach me, to be included in my circle of love, in our circle of love. I tell you, it's easy to preach it. But the real test is when they come through those doors or when you encounter them in your work life this week or somewhere in the community. Watch. Now I've given you this word. I know it's an old word. You can impress people at parties with it this week. I was just thinking about shibboleths the other day. What? Now I've given you this word, this shibboleth word. You're going to see it everywhere. You're going to see it on the news. You're going to see it in the newspapers. You're going to see it in books. You're going to see it in conversations. You're going to see people going to war over shades of green. It's killing us. And we have to stop it. And we, the church, should be, I believe, in the forefront of pioneering a world that lays down its shibboleths and starts to be more inclusive and loving and doesn't force people to make choices to join. I'll tell you now, God is not a joiner. He has no interest at all in joining anything. That's why I put out posts like, which I know you all see because you follow me, I put out posts like Jesus was not a Christian. Just to remind us all, he's not one of us. He's not one of us. You know, he's one of us, he's not one of them. He's not a Muslim, he's not a Buddhist, he's not a Catholic, he's not a Baptist. You know, he's one of us. He, he, he's a Christian and he's a Pentecostal type. He's not a Christian. He's God. God. He didn't join anything. He's not part of any group or tribe. Jesus died on the cross for humanity, not for Christianity. Do you understand that? Jesus died for the world, not for the church. And what we've done is we've grabbed the cross and made it our shibboleth. That belongs to us. Like when I was in this church, when I first went to church, all these things, that's for us. And I couldn't relate. I'm an outsider. And no one helped me. No one explained anything to me. And I felt more of an outsider. It's amazing that I lasted as long as I did. I'm still waiting to be followed up. <laughs> no one called me. I was the only Christian in my home, a family of eight. It was a nightmare being the first generation believer. Some of, you, some of you have been. I could have done with someone coming to me and explaining stuff to me that bothered me more than it should have done because there was no interpreter. There was no bridge crosses. Let's stand. Time's gone. Y'all okay? Yeah. All right. Well, let me say a massive thank you again to you guys for your love and your welcome. You're pretty cool, you Riverview guys. And I've got to tell you, the best is yet to come for this church. Thank God for everything you've had to now. But I've got to tell you, I feel it in my bones that I did from the first time I came here, even before I came here on a correspondence. The best stuff is yet to come. But I want you to know that that is far more to do with you and far less to do with God than you think it is. The best that's yet to come isn't in heaven waiting to be poured out. There's nothing in heaven waiting to be poured out. Nothing. Do you think heaven has anything better than Jesus? Heaven gave its best 2,000 years ago. God's got nothing in the cupboard better than Jesus. So I don't think we should be thinking there's some great outpouring coming. When I say to you the best is yet to come, please don't think in your self-talk, yeah, there's revival coming. No, no, I don't mean that. If there's a revival, it's you. Yeah. If there's a move of God, it looks like what you see in the mirror every day. You are a walking revival. You are a walking move of God. We are. And so when I talk about the best is yet to come, it depends on the caliber of people you become. Yeah. On your ability to reinvent and to grow and to flourish as a human being. It depends on that. That's why I'm doing this seminar around the world to assist you in becoming a brilliant human. The best version of you you can be. That's what I mean about brings the best days it could ever. It will happen for you personally. 
I mean it for you personally, that you, as you flourish, the best will come to you personally in this coming season if you'll keep flourishing. And it will happen as all of those individual flourishing souls come together and we flourish corporately. Yeah. It's irresistible. It's irresistible to be around people that are committed to self-improvement and personal development and be the best you that you can be. It's irresistible when people lay down their shibboleths and have a heart of love and a heart that includes everyone.